So since 2017, C4 has had the privilege of working with Earth Innovation Institute on some new and exciting research, which we were able to publish in this book, Transforming Red Plus, that came out last year. Um, this chapter 12 on subnational jurisdictional approaches builds on a bigger report um, that was also released last year. And we're lucky to have the authors of the chapter here together today at C4. So we wanted to take the opportunity and talk a little bit about the chapter in the book, some of the analysis behind it, and you know next steps for this work. So we'll start with Claudia Stickler. Um, Claudia is a scientist at Earth Innovation Institute, and she's the lead author of the book chapter. And Claudia is going to tell us about sort of the exciting and interesting findings from, from this work. Great. Well, thank you, Amy. It's nice to be here with you all. Um, so in this work, what we looked at were uh, 39 jurisdictions, subnational jurisdictions, that are all taking on some kind of work towards low emissions rural development. Um, and what we were particularly interested in seeing what kind of commitments they have made, um, to, especially to de reducing deforestation and emissions, as well as other things like improving agricultural production, incre increasing economic well-being, and so on. Um, and so I think one of the most interesting findings is that 38 of the 39 jurisdictions have taken on some kind of commitment in that line. 35 of them had signed the Rio Branco Declaration, which commits them to reducing deforestation 80% below the, their defined baselines. Um, that was conditional upon financing and other support, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And there were a few other uh, international commitments like that that they took on. So in terms of the, the financial support that these jurisdictions have received, um, international financial support, only 29 of the 39 had received anything to date or were scheduled to receive it, um, and totaling about $2.3 billion, which is actually significant. Um, and we're sure that there's been a lot more finance put in from domestic sources as well, but we haven't been able to total that yet. Um, what we also found, though, is that so far only one of the jurisdictions um, received any pay for performance financing, which has actually been one of the focal issues for reduction of emissions from deforestation and degradation, RED, um, and programs like that. So that was kind of an interesting finding. And we found also that in terms of partnerships with companies, um, who have taken on zero deforestation commitments and so on in the last few years. There's only 16 partnerships uh, with jurisdictions that exist, and only five of those are contracted. So that's kind of interesting because there's a sort of a global disconnect. Um, 473 corporate commitments have been made, 39 jurisdictional pledges, but only five formal partnerships exist. So we still have a long way to go in terms of supporting these jurisdictions to actually achieve the reductions that they've committed to. And still, many of them are actually making a lot of interesting progress. So that's something that we're really trying to focus on. Um, okay, so Claudia, you were talking about you know, concrete progress towards sustainability. What do you mean by that? Um, you know, how, did, how did we measure that? Well, so one thing that we did is we uh, took a framework of nine elements um, that we think help to define whether a jurisdiction is achieving sustainability across the entire um, jurisdiction. And those include especially whether they have an integrated lead R strategy, whether they have a spatial plan in place, whether they have performance targets that are measurable and quantifiable, whether they have a monitoring, reporting, and verification system, policy disincentives, uh, multi-stakeholder governance processes to support all of this, um, what their sustainable agricultural programs look like, and also rights recognition for indigenous peoples and local communities, um, as well as what kind of finance there is for low emission development. Um, what we found is interesting is that actually in all of the jurisdictions, the the jurisdictions were most advanced with um, spatial plans and multi-stakeholder processes related to low emission development, um, where they tended to be in earlier stages were with the monitoring, reporting, and verification systems with sustainable agriculture policies and initiatives and other programs to support that, as well as just general finance toward low emission development. So that's kind of interesting because especially the monitoring, reporting, and verification is something that's been under discussion for 
more than 12 years now since we initially started talking about red at the, the UNFCCC meeting in Bali in 2007. Um, so that was a little bit surprising that so many jurisdictions still aren't that advanced with, with that. Um, we were heartened though to see that multi-stakeholder processes were developing well in all of these jurisdictions or in many of them. Um, so that creates sort of a basis for really having buy-in from, from the different land users and other stakeholders who need to be involved. Sounds great, yeah, thank you. Um, so there was a lot of analysis um, and, and work behind these findings. And uh, Juan Pablo Ardila is also a scientist at Earth Innovation Institute. Um, he's Colombian. And he's sort of the mastermind behind a lot of these analyses. So he can tell us a bit about, you know, what's behind these numbers and some other simulations of, of um, looking towards trying to stay below 1.5 degree warming um, that, that were included in the broader report. So Juan Pablo. Okay. Okay. We had two different approaches. We followed two different approaches to this. The first one was uh, we partnered with local experts uh, who interview local actors or local institutions at the subnational level, at the jurisdictional level, in each of those places that Claudia just described, to find key information on the elements of sustainability, or so jurisdictional sustainability. And this is what is captured now in the report and in the larger study. And beyond that, we also uh, look at uh, national statistics, some national statistics from Ministry of Forestry, from Ministry of Agriculture, and we try to find the best data that could also tell us like the official figure on what's happening in those places in terms of forest protection, forest restoration, climate, change, cl climate mitigation uh, projects, and agricultural output. So having all this data really helps us to be very creative and, and, and model what's happening in those places. Uh, in terms of forest protection or climate change mitigation, we did uh, a very interesting simulation model looking at what could be the potential uh, impact that those jurisdictions could have towards mitigating climate change. We have basically the most, I mean, just the core message should be that we have a zero net deforestation scenario whereby 2030, these uh, 39 jurisdictions collectively will avoid 12 gigatons of CO2 emissions and that, uh, put in a different way, it would represent nearly 10% uh, or 12% of the total climate change solution. And this is a, a very optimal solution if it turns on how costly it is, uh, the, the efforts or the investment that the tropical uh, places have to put, as well as the uh, efforts from the private sector that needs to support these sort of natural uh, solutions. Because not only considering the model, this will be a solution that extends further than 2030. So I think that's the, the main message regarding the climate change solution and the modeling of carbon, uh, carbon emissions in those 39 jurisdictions. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so I, I just will continue along the questioning. This is, we also have with us um, Daniel Nepstad, who's the executive director of Earth Innovation Institute and has been working to support these kinds of approaches for a long time. Um, Dan, of course, was involved in the research, but it would be interesting, Dan, to have your perspective about what do you see as the value of this study moving forward? Great, thanks, Amy, and it's really a delight. I'm delighted to be part of this, this discussion. Um, so if we take the core conclusion of the study, which basically says a third of the world tropical forests are contained within the boundaries of states, provinces, and regional governments that have committed to solve the problem of deforestation, to promote rest restoration, and they've done quite a bit already. Uh, but the, the study also shows that we have not really, we, the broader global community, given them a strong reason to continue. And, you know, one way of looking at this is that a lot of our strategies have been to scare businesses and investors away from places or enterprises that involve deforestation. So we've been really good on creating risk, and we've sort of ignored the other side of that, which is to create secure pathways to partnerships. And it seems like one of the implications of the study then is to move this agenda forward to to realize this enormous potential as a global climate change solution, we need to get to those secure pathways. Okay. And what does a secure pathway mean? It, it means coming to a, a broadly shared definition of progress. 
so that the campaigns from Greenpeace and, and Mighty Earth and other advocacy groups, which are extremely important and have created the risk associated with deforestation, are also pushing businesses and investors into the partnerships that we need to translate this potential into reality. So one, one of the possibilities is to come to an agreement on what are the basic principles and rules for defining those secure pathways and, and which jurisdictions uh, qualify. And um, so we're looking at the possibility of, of creating a, a tropical forest champions uh, network where a state can voluntarily agree or, or decide to register itself earn this protected status. In other words, companies that do business in that jurisdiction are not going to be subject to attacks <clears throat> for any bad actors that might be uh, present in that jurisdiction. And all jurisdictions have some companies or producers who are not doing things right. Um, and see if this could help unleash this potential uh, more effectively. And uh, so far there is uh, what's called a call for collaboration from tropical forest uh, government leaders. Uh, developed uh, with the Governor's Climate Forest Task Force that lays out a very simple set of proposals for these are the rules that the governments of, of the GCF, the Governor's Climate Forest Task Force, would like to see implemented and respected to, to get to this more positive approach to the issue of tropical deforestation. You know, sort of interestingly, there's a lot of promotion these days for holistic landscape approaches, jurisdictional approaches, and you know this work, at least for me personally, it's just been very clear that we're still really trying to understand what that means and, and from a research perspective, understanding how to measure and assess progress um, to actually support the kinds of networks and, and systems that are being put into place to, to um, support you know, states and provinces, districts, municipalities, um, tropical forest governments who are trying to make concrete change. Thanks to all of you for being here today and for being at C4 campus and we hope to welcome you again. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.